His Excellency Amin Jamal's political uh, life has been dedicated to promoting the sovereignty, independence of a free and pluralistic Lebanon. I would like to tell you that we have a number of challenges this evening. The most serious one is that we have a wonderful speaker who's having a very difficult, even a more difficult time than I am speaking. He lost his vocal cords. So uh, he really should not be here with us, but he's very courageous and determined to uh, not disappoint you, and he will give his talk a go. So let's give <laughs> President Shamayel a very warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> unfortunately I had the uh, voice extinction this morning. I don't know why, maybe it's the weather in uh, Zurich or, uh, or maybe the subject, the issue by itself is so embarrassing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> if it's uh, difficult for me to pursue the, uh, this presentation, I'll ask my dear friend, Dr. Ebner, maybe he could take over the text and maybe it will be easier for you to understand. Uh, and uh, it will be easier for everybody, maybe. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, good evening. Before proceeding to the substance of my remarks, I would like to offer heartfelt thanks to first the President Herbert Mayer, President, international president of the CSI, and also to my dear friend, Dr. Eibner. Under their distinguished leadership, Christian Solidarity International has worked tirelessly, often under the most challenging circumstances, to help construct societies and the broader international environment defined by religious freedom and the human rights. Is it okay? <laughs> for, those, for those of us experiencing firsthand what I have called the crisis of pluralism in the Middle East, we draw thanks and reassurances from having steadfast allies like CSI the present mayor and John Eibner. And on another personal note, I would like to express my distinct pleasure that you are meeting here today in Switzerland, a land with a long tradition of upholding two vital systems that thrive on pluralism and tolerance, democracy and diplomacy. During my tenure as president of Lebanon, a country that, as you know, was one called the Switzerland of the Middle East. My administration periodically called on the good offices of Swiss diplomacy. Most prominently, during the two national dialogue conferences convened in Lausanne and Geneva in 1983 and 1984. Those gatherings sought to use the principles and techniques of diplomacy to restore the best Lebanese traditions of political democracy and social pluralism. Regrettably, three decades later, my country, Lebanon, as well as several countries of the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region, are in dire need of democracy and pluralism. In light of this harsh but undeniable diagnosis in my, in my remarks, I would like to explore two related themes. First, amid the Arab world's crisis of pluralism, why religious pluralism matters. And second, how religious pluralism can be preserved and over the long term enhanced. In short, I hope to explain why preserving religious pluralism in the Middle East is not an option, it's not an option, but rather a vital imperative. As I speak, please keep in mind that religious pluralism, at the term is used here, does not refer to the mere fact 
of religious diversity. Rather, religious pluralism is a mindset under which members of distinct religious communities uphold a shared duty not only to tolerate but also to respect each other's fundamental rights, both as citizens as human beings. Simply put, religious pluralism means that none are socially or politically, politically privileged due to religious belief or affiliation. And by the same token, none are discriminated against. Dr. <laughs> maybe could you take the, the floor? Maybe it's better for them because it's... <laughs> They don't want our audience to suffer such kind of <laughs> <laughs> such kind of punishment. <laughs> so if you insist <laughs> offer some alarming observations about the status of Christians in the Arab world. But before doing so, I must emphasize, and in the strongest terms, that the crisis of pluralism we are living through is not about any one religious tradition or community. Rather, we must begin our analysis by stating that, generally speaking, the Middle East is an unforgiving place for any community that does not constitute the majority within its figurative neighborhood. This holds true for religiously, ethnically, politically, and culturally distinct groups, and I explain why. And so, let us acknowledge that religious communities, not part of the neighborhood majority, are victimized by the region's lack of democracy and pluralism. So it's a problem of democracy, respect of pluralism, more than a problem of living together, togetherness among the various religions in the area. To cite some of the numerous examples that come to mind, we can look to the status of Druze, Shia, Hausi, Alawites, Baha'i, and many others. Like was Shia living in Sunni-dominated areas, and Sunni living in Shia-dominated areas, typically experienced conditions ranging from mild social discrimination and to severe governmental persecution. That's reality in various countries in the area. For their part, Christians in the Arab world have for decades experienced a worsening environment and in the last 10 years or so long, long standing or so long standing negative trends have intensified. Reasons for this include wars, occupations, political turmoil, economic disruption, and the rise of religious extremism, always threatening and often violent who target anyone and everyone who refuses to bow before their perverse and retrograde worldview. And so, in recent years, we have witnessed an exodus approaching biblical proportions as Arab Christians have fled their ancient homelands. For example, in Egypt, in so many ways, the leading Arab nation, the Coptic community have been subjected to church burnings, physical assaults, and even killings. In Iraq, Christians face a similar onslaught of murder 
and church desecrations. <clears throat> As for Syria, this audience, this audience is well aware of the wholesale destruction that the war is inflicting on all Syrians regardless of faith. Compounding their particular difficulties, Syrian Christians have been under sustained attack by extremists. They are demonstrated by the separate high-profile kidnappings of two Syrian bishop, bishops and a group of nuns. Equally disturbing, in regions of Syria, where they have imposed a rule better described as a bloody-minded reign of terror, ultra-radical Islamists, such as Al-Nusra Front, have implemented extremely harsh Sharia law, including a draconian injunction that Christians must either convert to Islam or else pay a very expensive tax. In response, in response to intensifying persecution, the State Department declared in early March that the United States deplores continued threats against Christians and other minorities in Syria, while increasingly targeted by extremists. I gratefully acknowledge the U.S. government's eloquent words, but also call for urgent actions to back them up by action, not only by words. In my own country, Lebanon, a long-established president of Christian immigration has increased in recent years, driven by assassinations, political upheaval, and the deliberate incapacitation of state institutions by certain political elements. Taking a region-wide and historical view of the Arab world's crisis of pluralism from a Christian perspective, we can offer the following grim summation. According to estimates at the beginning of the 20th century, Christian continued, constituted about 20% of the total population of the Middle East. <clears throat> Today, today, that figure has dwindled to just 5%. Projecting population trends forward, the Christians remaining in the Middle East is 12 million, may be reduced by 50% in less than a decade. This bleak picture demonstrates that the region is buffeted by a crisis pluralism and that Christians are perhaps its primary victims. Why religious pluralism in the Arab world matters? <clears throat> Why? At this point, some might pose the question, why amid a world beset with conflict, turbulence, and challenges, thus preserving religious pluralism the Arab world, and why the Middle East matter. In response, regional, global, and religious factors can be cited. <laughs> Regionally speaking, we must remember the historic contributions made, made by Christians to the various Arab states and to the Arabic civilization as a whole. Here we can recall the conclusion offered last year by His Royal Highness King Abdullah of Jordan, and I quote, the protection of the rights of Christians is a duty rather than, rather than a favor. Christians have always played a key role in building our societies and defending our nations, end of quote. Globally, the Christian communities that constitute an essential element of the mosaic, mosaic of the Arab world, are a natural bridge between the, the East and the West. In fact, no other group is better positioned to explain the two sides to each other. 
By way of, of historical example, we can reflect on the cross-cultural role played by a great generation of Christian Lebanese Americans who in the early 20th century made a significant and lasting contribution to the dialogue of civilizations. Yes, the dialogue of civilizations. Khalil Jobran, Jobran Khalil Jobran, Amin Rihani, Mikhail Naimi, Charles Malik, enriched the life of the mind and spirit through English and Arabic works that still inspire countless readers worldwide. Each in his own way blended advanced Western learnings, learning and traditional Eastern wisdom and helped inspire the greatest renaissance of Arabic literature in modern times. Finally, religiously it's impossible to envision the, ex the existence of vibrant world embracing Christian community if its historic anchor, namely Middle East Christians, disappears. Now, having described the problem and sketched its importance, I would like to offer some thoughts on possible solutions to the Arab world's crisis of pluralism. First of all, the regional precondition, restoring stability. The first and most obvious point to be made is that religious communities cannot enjoy the blessings of pluralism unless they live in stable societies. In terms of the Middle East today, then creating a positive form of stability is the most urgent priority. Today, creating stability entails reaching negotiating settlements in a string of political, politically volatile countries, most especially Syria. Therefore, all responsible parties within and outside that, that country should focus on creating a power-sharing agreement that preserves core state institutions while also dismantling the pervasive machinery of repression. Despite and even because of the failure of the last month's Geneva II conference on Syria, diplomatic and peacekeeping efforts must be redoubled. Where is Mr. Laham? It's, uh, <clears throat> we have here the representative of Akhdar Ibrahim, the representative of the UN Security Council to the Conference of Geneva. So we salute him. National solutions, there is the regional precondition and the national solutions. It's building democracy to promote pluralism. Prospects for preserving religious pluralism in the Middle East will receive a tremendous boost when the war in Syria ends but efforts to preserve pluralism must proceed even as Syria, Syrian peace is fruitfully negotiated and maybe unfruitfully negotiated. Here, uh, it must be stated with conviction that the best option for preserving religious pluralism is not a return to the old discredited model of social peace through political dictatorship. Instead, allow me to make what some may consider to be a bold declaration. Despite negative trends that cannot be denied and should, be, should not be ignored, three years of the Arab awakening remains one of the great hope-inspiring developments of early 21st century history. I've to take into consideration the great achievements in the Arab world, what we call the Arab Spring. Yes, it must be conceded that some formerly promising countries, such as Libya and Yemen, have not transitioned from dictatorship to democracy. 
But this was never going to be a swift or straight worded process. And indeed, the in-between stages have been quite messy. But there are some reasons to be optimistic that the Arab democracies can emerge and that they will guarantee they, they will guarantee political, social, and religious pluralism. In the case of Egypt, for example, no matter who wins the upcoming presidential election, the new government will have no choice but to negotiate and compromise with those useful forces of change that so recently inspired the world by launching a peaceful revolution. And let us recall that during the initial phase of the anti-Mubarak protest, a cadre of young Egyptian revolutionaries called for democracy and pluralism under the slogan, and I quote, the cross and the Quran altogether. Personally, I'm confident that the youth of Egypt will do everything within their not inconsiderable power to ensure that their country emerges as an Arab democracy, a development that would have wide-ranging repercussions, not only regionally, but also globally. Beyond Egypt, perhaps the greatest hope for the Arab democracy is Tunisia. Fittingly, the birthplace of the Arab awakening. The constitution recently promulgated by Tunisia broadly representative national constituent assembly was the result of a long deliberative process, one guided by spirit of, of common enterprise and rational compromise. The resulting charter describes decisive measures such as creating a civil state, guaranteeing gender parity in elected bodies, and enshrining universal human rights, including significantly religious pluralism. With this progressive constitution, Tunisia takes its place alongside Lebanon at the Arab world's second internally created demography, democracy. The consequence of this achievement as an inspiration model for the region cannot be overstated. Dr. Ibnid, maybe the punishment is uh, enough like this. <laughs> maybe you can, please. Well, uh, well I, I think we'll, you have been punished enough, and I'll try to do justice to your, to your talk. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by reviewing a few other short and long-term pathways to pluralism. Writing in the pages of a leading American newspaper in 2011, our host, he refers to me here, I don't know whether that's why you asked me to speak at this time, um, uh, offered a proposal that is even more necessary today. He urged President Obama to, and I quote, establish a high-level interagency task force within the U.S. government to prepare a strategy aimed at securing religious freedom and diversity in the Middle East. Allow me to expand on this advice by urging not only European governments, but also the European Union structure in Brussels to establish such working groups. Fittingly, the Catholic Church has already taken the lead and provided an example that secular institutions can replicate. According to a recent media report from Beirut, quote, the Vatican has already formed a crisis committee on the subject of Christians in the Middle East and has commissioned a group of bishops to prepare a report detailing the reality facing Christians in the region and their reasons for emigrating 
as well as identifying possible solutions. At the very least, the Vatican's committee can ensure that greater governmental and public attention is focused on the Arab world's crisis of pluralism. Regrettably, in this regard, the conclusion offered by the prominent American journalist Jeffrey Goldberg a year ago remains valid. The persecution of Arab Christians, said Goldberg, is, and I quote, one of the most undercovered stories in the international media. Of course, it is obvious that any effort to preserve and enhance religious pluralism in the Middle East must be led by the region's Christians, along with representatives of the moderate Muslim majority. International partners also need to provide assistance. Fortunately, in recent years, influential voices from within the Muslim community have spoken out in favor of an interfaith dialogue. For example, great symbolism was on display in late 2007 when King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia met with Pope Benedict at the Vatican. And the spirit of those talks found institutional expression in October 2011 when King Abdullah founded his International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue in Vienna. Also in 2011, an important pro-democracy statement was issued by Grand Imam Ahmed al Tayeb, Grand Sheikh of the prestigious Al-Azhar University in, or Al-Azhar establishment in Cairo, the world's leading center of Sunni Muslim thought. In Lebanon, a, ma a major Sunni leader, Saad Hariri, former prime minister, pleaded strongly for the moderation and dialogue. Today, if Tunisia is not to be the sole success story of the Arab awakening, then Arab reformers need to focus on the vital, vital issue of education. To inspire Arab youth to support universal values of freedom, democracy, and pluralism, access to primary and higher education must be enhanced. Above all, new curricula at all educational levels must emphasize the teaching of tolerance, togetherness, and partnership. Beyond educational reform, to consolidate the Arab awakening countries must create those classic institutions that brace the frame of, embrace the frame of democracy, namely parliaments, executives, and courts with independent identities and constitutionally guaranteed powers. The challenge for Arabs of all faiths at this crucial moment is to demonstrate that the Middle East is capable of achieving pluralism, freedom, and modernity. Now is the time for this troubled region to transcend sectarianism and define a concept of citizenship based on universal values of democracy and tolerance, including religious freedom. In this regard, I would like to share that I recently drafted a concept paper or charter for achieving Arab democracy the text of which can be found on the following link, and that's www.aminjamailoneword.org. The charter discusses key democratic provisions that must be strengthened in the Arab world, including human rights, civil rights, religious rights, media rights, and perhaps most crucially, the protection of pluralism. Conclusion. Furthermore, Late last year at Washington, D.C., at a Washington, D.C. event organized by the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the Maison de Futur in Beirut, I suggested that the time has come to launch an Arab Marshall Plan. As envisaged, the Arab Marshall Plan would be led by Arabs, supported by established democracies of the Atlantic community, and dedicated to forging partnerships with and among the emerging communities of uh, Arab Democrats. Just as the historical Marshall Plan was an accelerator of economic development, political moderation, and international cooperation, I firmly believe that an Arab Marshall Plan could help transform the troubled Middle East. 
in terms of freedom and pluralism, the proposed Arab Marshall Plan could give priority to education and dialogue to promote solutions of togetherness and respect for pluralism. These and related educational me measures can be bundled together under the theme, quote, evolution of minds while maintaining identities, end quote. In terms of governance, the Arab Marshall Plan could focus on issues of openness, transparency, and the rotation of power. We can call this approach, quote, reform of institutions, unquote. Above all, the Arab Marshall Plan must emphasize the promise of partnership as something separate and distinct from the old paternalism. The historical Marshall Plan succeeded because it encouraged Europeans to cooperate with each other and, based on that cooperation, to build enduring partnerships. Likewise, the Arab Marshall Plan must encourage talented Arabs in key sectors of state and society especially the youth, to cooperate with each other across sectarian, ethnic, and national boundaries, and then to build lasting relationships with international partners, especially in Europe and North America. I am pleased that the discussions between the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the Maison de Futur about, the, about their collaborative efforts are ongoing, and for all, and for its part, the MDF anticipates that the Arab Marshall Fund uh, will play a major part in this emerging partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arab world and the global community are faced with a great historic opportunity. I urge members of this distinguished audience to contribute to the historic task of preserving and enhancing religious pluralism in the Middle East. And thank you very much. I'm President Jamayev.